We're continuing our October message series entitled Kiss My Past. Kiss My Past. And for those of you that remember and recall last week, first service, I shared with you three things to kissing your past. Those three things were, number one, you got to forget, which means you got to let go and pass the things that you were imprisoned by. Number two, you got to fight. That means you got to build the muscle to, to preserve the integrity of your, of your current state. And number three, you got to finish, which means you got to end and complete whatever the cycles were that, that you were in. And so today I want to really connect both conversations because I believe they have a very important place in where you and I are headed beyond this series. And I want to take a few minutes to talk to you from the subject entitled, Keep It Moving, Keep It Moving, Keep It Moving. And we're going to use Exodus chapter 40 and the storyline between verses 32 through 38, Amplified Classic Version. That's Exodus chapter 40, verses 32 through 38. We're going to use that as a biblical basis to share with you Three things keeping it moving produces. Three things keeping it moving produces. I mean, let, let, let's just keep it a buck today, y'all. If, if you're going to go through all this work to forget, if you're going to go through all this work to fight, if you're going to go through all this work to finish, then as you begin making forward progress, it's important for you to know how to keep it moving. Can we all agree on that? And so these are three things keeping it moving produces. So I'll give you each of these three things very quickly. I'll give you the corresponding verses to all three, and then we'll get into the details. Three things keeping it moving produces. If you're taking notes, according to Exodus chapter 40, verses 32 and 33, the first thing keeping it moving produces is your discipline. Keeping it moving produces your discipline, your discipline, your discipline. According to Exodus 40 verses 34 and 35, the second thing keeping it moving produces is your direction, your direction, keeping it moving produces your direction. And according to Exodus 40 verses 36 through 38, the third thing that keeping it moving produces is your deliverance, your deliverance. Those are the three things keeping it moving produces. Make sure we're all on the same faith and frequency. I want you to shout them back to me. Keeping it moving produces, number one, what? Your discipline. Keeping it moving produces, number two, what? Your direction. Keeping it moving produces, number three, what? Your discipline, your direction, and your deliverance. So let's take a look at the first <clears throat> of these three things that keeping it moving produces, your discipline. What? is discipline you're taking good notes here it is discipline describes the suppression of base desires the suppression of base desires in other words when you're disciplined you have the ability the the capacity you got the wherewithal to suppress or to harness base desires or in other words you have the ability to harness these cravings, these things that you want that have been embedded in your soul based on past experiences. So discipline allows you to suppress those cravings, to suppress those deep desires. But those cravings and deep desires are all based on past experiences. This is what discipline provides for you. Now, it's important to know that your base desires, ladies and gentlemen, are not biblical desires. There's a fundamental difference between base desires and biblical desires. As a matter of fact, biblical desires are things God puts in your heart that match the character of his spirit. Okay, there's a very familiar scripture we use. God will give you and I the desires of our heart. 
Well, for God to give you the desires of, it, of your heart, it doesn't mean that he's granting you the manifestation of all these cravings that have been embedded in your soul from past experiences. What that means is that God has certain things that he has designated for you that match the character of his spirit that he will embed in your heart after base desires have been removed. So biblical desires are things God puts in your heart that match the character of his spirit. Base desires, on the other hand, are things we put in our heart, things that we don't need, and things we should live without until we become what God wants us to be. That, that's so important. Because it, it, it doesn't mean that there are certain things in our heart that God don't want to give us. It just means God wants to make sure that when he gives it to us, we have become what he wanted us to be. In other words, you know just well as I know. If it was just me and you in a one-on-one -on -one conversation right now and we wasn't live streaming to the world and everybody wasn't watching us with all these lights on, there are some things we got going on in our heart that we know good and well the current version of us can't handle the other stuff God want to do. So these are biblical desires and base desires. I want you to write this down because this is important to discipline. Discipline is when one uses reason to determine the best course of action regardless of one's desires. So how do you know that you've kept it moving in the direction of the things of God to the point that it has produced discipline in you? How do you know you're disciplined? Well, you know you're disciplined when you can properly use reason to determine the best course of action for your life, regardless of the stuff that's been embedded in your heart from experiences in the past. So when you think about the decisions we make for the course of our lives as to where we live, who we date, uh, what we drive, how we dress, how we act, who we fool with, what type of relationships we have, all of these courses of action will be correct when we have become disciplined as a result of moving consistently in the direction of the things of God. If you're taking notes, here's a good one for you. Discipline is the commencement. That's a big bougie word right there. Discipline is the commencement of becoming the, the version of you that the promise is designated for. I'm going to let that soak right there for somebody. Discipline is the commencement. Discipline is the, the ceremonial act. That's what the commencement is. It is, it is literally a ceremonial act. Discipline is the beginning. It is the starting point of becoming the version of you that the promise is designated for. If you are questioning why you don't see the manifestation of what Prophet Ramon, Pastor Kim, and everybody else done prophesied to you, it ain't an issue with the promise. I can't hear nobody. The only issue is the process of becoming the version of me that the promise has been designated for. Because once you become the version of you that matched the characteristic of him, guess what shows up? The promise. I don't know what your promise is. It could be a, a boo. It could be a different lifestyle. It could be a job. It could be a move. It could be health. Whatever the promise is, God has already designated the promise for you. So don't worry about the promise. Repeat after me, as of today, I refuse to worry about the promise. It's already designated for me. So all you got to do is to become the version of you that the promise 
has been designated for. Now let's contextualize this to Exodus chapter 40 because we're beginning at verse 32 and 33 for this first thing that keeping it moving produces, which is discipline. And if you contextualize what's happening in Exodus chapter 40, God, here's the hood part of me, done already brought them out of the hood. They had already been brought out of what was. By this point, they were not dealing with Pharaoh and his army. They were not enslaved and imprisoned by the cycles of their past. Hence, is one of the biggest problems we face as a Christian community. We get so excited because we not where we used to be that we forget we still ain't where he wants us to be. <laughs> I appreciate all four of y'all over here. So, so, so the difference between what was and what will be is me moving in the direction of the things of God. So by the time we get to Exodus 40, verse 32, Moses got a little sense. He had done experienced a few things in the process, like some of you, because I'm, I'm right there with you. You, you, you. you get to a certain point in life. You know, you hit a certain age threshold. You, you just don't tolerate crazy stuff like you used to. I wish I had a witness right there. You, some of you are a little young and you know what I'm talking about because you done been through some stuff. You just get to a point in your life that I ain't going to just keep testifying about God delivered me from drugs and he saved me from the street and I ain't in the hood no more. I'm ready to start testifying about some new stuff that God is doing in my life. I'm ready to start telling some people I'm finally a millionaire. I just bought my house. I'm, I'm, I'm married and happy now. Who am I talking to? God said, I want to give you a new testimony. Testimony. I don't want to keep hearing the same old, same old about where you came from and what you've been through and how you were abused and victimized. Let's start testifying about something new. Mm -hmm. So notice what happens in verse 32. The Bible says, when they went into the temple, that's a very important point just right there, because they had to get up and go in. One of the biggest components to not repeating the same cycle is to get up and start moving forward. You, you don't need a, a squad of support just to start. As a matter of fact, Moses teaches us that God... God was waiting on him as opposed to thinking they were waiting on God. <laughs> you, you did not come here today, sing songs, listen to a word and serve in hopes that God will show up. You came here, I'm getting ready to mess you up, as a guest to a God that was here waiting on you already. Woo oh my God, y'all gonna make me cut up early. I'm telling you, this is one thing I love about going to church every week because it gives me an opportunity to always consistently enter into his gates with thanksgiving. I'm coming down somebody row right there and into his courts with prayer. If you did not come here as a guest to the glory of God, you came to the wrong building. If you came here waiting for God to show up, you'd have missed the whole memo, boo. But if you came into the house of the Lord, no Whatever it is that I'm going through in my life, God's getting ready to show up. He's going to show out. He's going to give it to me. If I'm sick in my body, he's going to heal me. If I'm bound, he's going to deliver me. If I need a blessing, he's going to release a blessing. Is there anybody here that came as a guest? Well, why don't you start acting like you are a guest of him and he's not a Touch somebody and tell them we're his guest. 
uh uh-uh, that's the wrong person. Touch somebody else and tell them we're his guests. So we got to act accordingly. When the anointing shows up, I have a responsibility to act accordingly. When the praise singers and worshipers are giving us an opportunity to give God the glory, we supposed to respond accordingly. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, I'm not waiting until I leave where I'm a guest at. I'm going to give God glory in his... So when they came into the temple, they came in near the altar and notice what they did. They washed as the Lord commanded Moses. They did some. Okay. In verse 33, he erected the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and he set up the hanging or screen at the court gate and he finished the work. He finished the work. He understood in no uncertain terms that keeping it moving produced enough discipline for him to complete the last cycle of his past. Rev, make it relevant to me. Don't leave this service entertaining a text or a voicemail based on something you have ended a cycle about. Don't clock in to work on your next work day as the version of you who you was when you clocked out the last work day. Child, you know what happened? And you stop right there. Child, I don't care what happened. (laughs) Last Tuesday's version of me would have been nosy. But today's version of me is moving in a direction that I have too much to lose. I'm, I'm, on, I'm on a journey to get what God's got. See, if you, if you got time to play games, I ain't talking to you. But for those of you that know, I am not going to end 2024 and go into 2025 hoping and wishing and praying that God does for me that he already wants to do. Now, how does this apply to you? Here's how it applies to you. Because you should know like Moses knew that, notice this, very important point before I go on. Missing the promise was not because God didn't want to give them the promise. So, so, so Moses walked and moved in a way that demonstrated if, if I miss this promise, it ain't because God don't want to give me the promise. If I miss this promise, it's only because I mismanage the process for the promise. <laughs> Did you catch that? Let me say it again. If you don't get what God told you in 2024, he was going to give to you. It ain't because he ain't got it for you. The only way you will miss it is if you mismanage the process that qualifies you for it. (laughs) Here's a free footnote you ain't even going to see on the screen. Missing the promise results from mismanaging the process. Missing the promise results from mismanaging the process. So if I mismanage... The process that God puts me through that he knows will be used for me to become the version of me that the the promise is designated for. If I mismanage that process, it, it ain't God's fault. It ain't my haters fault. It ain't my ex's fault. It ain't my nasty no good cousin's fault. It ain't my crazy supervisor's fault. It's my fault because I missed manage my process. Repeat these words after me. My promise is tied 
to the proper management of my process. <sighs> Mic drop right there. Y'all want to say that again? Repeat after me. My promise. Y'all said it a little low like me. Let me say it a little louder. Repeat after me. My promise is tied to the proper management of my process. Mm -hmm. When you keep it moving and manage the process, you will capture the manifestation. Everybody got that? So all you got to do is keep it moving. And where are you moving? You're moving in the direction of the things of God. What in this relationship is important to God? What in my employment on this job is important to God? Whatever the thing is that I am actively participating in, whether it is associated to people, places, things, or all of the above, I have to move toward the things of God until I become disciplined enough to allow the process of my participation to turn me into the best version of me. I'm going to move on. But for some of you who are employed, the only reason why you hadn't been able to move on from the job you really don't like, that you know really don't match your anointing, is because you hadn't become the person you need to be for the other job that's waiting on you. Sucked all the air out the room right there. Yeah. See, I'm from the streets. I, I know I don't look like what I've been through. I got saved in a trap house. And anytime I communicate and talk with some of my old homeboys who still doing their little thug thizzle, they all say the same thing. Rip. Rip. Listen, Rev, I, I ain't ready now. Once, once I get my money right, I'm going I'm to I'm get out the game, dog. And, and I be trying to explain to them, you, you will never get out the game once you get your money right. Get your heart right while you're in the game, and a changed heart will get you. God, I can't hear nobody. See, if you ain't been through nothing, I ain't even talking to you. But if you've been through some stuff and you know when the power of God and the glory of God gets in that situation, you ain't got to fuss, you ain't got to fight, you ain't got to bicker, you ain't got to go against and contend against any person, place, or thing. All you got to do is continue to move towards the glory of God. And when the glory shows up, oh my God, it's on and popping. Which brings me to the second thing that keeping it moving produces which is your direction. So, so, so Moses, Moses, for my hood figures, Moses, Moses had motion. Some of you bougie saints ain't going to understand that one right there. I can hear y'all calling somebody at the church. What was he referring to when he said motion? <laughs> Moses had motion, y'all. He was doing the doggone thing. He, he was making moves, and his moves produced discipline. And as, as he became more disciplined, his moves produced direction. What is direction? Thank you for asking. Your direction, if you're taking notes, is your ability to aim at the right target and to reach an expected end. I prophesied this to first service, and I'm going to prophesy it to those of you in second service. You ready for this word? For the rest of this year moving forward, every target you set, you will hit. Okay, I got two people over here. I shouldn't have to tell you how to respond. 
I, I said every target you set, you I don't care if your target is to hit six figures in three months. I don't care if your target is to move to a house you didn't build or a vineyard you didn't plant. Whatever the target is that you set, God told me to tell you that you're going to hit it and you're going to reach your expected end. Now, I want somebody to put a praise on that thing right there. <laughs> Let me, let me move on. Your direction is your focus. Your F-O-C-U-S, the acronym for your direction describes your ability to follow one course until successful. So, so when moving produces direction, you ain't all over the place. You ain't over here today and over there tomorrow. There is a consistency about your moves because your direction is your focus, which describes your ability to follow one course of action. I'm going to push past it, but I want you to read in your own time verses 34 and 35, because immediately after Moses finished, those two scriptures show us that the glory cloud moved on top of the sanctuary. I mean, it's as if the cloud of glory is outside across the street and then we in here start going in and the glory cloud like, hold on, what they doing over at Limitless and start moving in our direction. Verse 34 and 35 explains to us the sequence of events that happens because, again, moving towards the things of God produces your direction. God knows how to aim for you to be able to hit your target. Did you, did you hear what I said? Because you're not following crowds, you're following the cloud. What is the cloud? Here's what the cloud is. The cloud is God's sign and symbol of divine direction. The cloud is actually your guide through every process and into your place of promise. Now, is there a physical cloud that you see in and through your circumstances? Maybe, most likely not. But there's a spiritual dynamic that is set in motion that gives you this itchy suspicion you need to hang up. You're on the call and you just feel something ain't right. Leave the stove. You understand what I'm saying? The, the, the cloud shows up differently for you and I. When you know this is not the decision you should make and you ain't got peace about it and they just pushing you and pressuring you to sign on the dotted line. Listen, if what God's got for me is here today, it'll be here tomorrow. Every time Israel was stationed at the tabernacle, they were directed to practice. This is so important for us in the New Testament church because when we are stationed at the tabernacle like we are, God uses it to direct us to practice. This is practice. But notice this, every time Israel was summoned from the tabernacle, not at the tabernacle, they were directed to produce. So if I can successfully practice moving towards the things of God until he disciplines me and directs me, what happens is when I'm not in the tabernacle, when I'm away from the tabernacle, my practice, it produces results. So if you're living a result-less life when you are away from the tabernacle, you need to readjust your practice when you are in the tabernacle. Does that make sense? This is all practice for how your life looks on a day-to-day -day basis. Last one, I only got a few more minutes. Number three, keeping it moving produces your deliverance. So if you notice, I'm moving in the direction of the things of God and my momentum, my moves produce Number one, what? It produces what? Huh? 
it produces discipline. It gives me the capacity, the wherewithal to suppress base desires. As I continue to move in that direction, it produces what? Direction. Now I have the ability to set targets and follow one course until I see the manifestation. I see the end results. As a result of this motion, I now develop the ability to see deliverance so that I'm not just testifying about where I came from. I'm telling people where God brought me to. Very quickly before we go, I want to read verses 34 because 36 rather through 38. The Bible says in verse 36, in all their journeys, all their journeys, not some, in all, in all. So, so do you understand? I don't, I don't bring God into my church life, but bring him out of my marriage life. The same God that's involved in my marriage He's going to be involved in my next business deal. I don't ask God to give me wisdom about my kids, but God, I got this when it comes to what car I'm going to drive. You, you understand what I'm saying? If you, if you engage God in this spiritual way, you have a higher likelihood of success. You are less likely to fail because if the glory ain't there, you ain't going to stay there. Notice what happens. In all their journeys, whenever the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, the Israelites went on. So basically, when the cloud of God's glory moved, they moved. So I want to be in motion, but I want my motion and my moves to be at the discretion and the divine discipline and direction of God that's how I stay out of a whole lot of trouble <laughs> verse 37 says but if the cloud was not taken up and they did not journey on to the day that was taken up for throughout all their journeys the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day and fire was in it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel I want you to stand to your feet I'm gonna share with you these last few points before we pray but here's, here's, what I want, here's what I want you to, to, to remember as it relates to, to your deliverance. Deliverance carries the idea of throwing, thrusting, and handing over everything. So when I'm delivered, it doesn't mean I don't have struggles. It doesn't mean I don't have challenges. It just means I have a new awareness of what's going on in my life and I recognize through this awareness that what's going on in my life right now is being used by God to help me become the next version of me that qualifies for the promise. I mean, do you, do you, do you get that? You, you ain't going through nothing today that's throwing God off and you ain't being allowed to go through something that God ain't using to help you become a better version of you truth is some of the people you going back and forth with they don't even know they're just instruments used by God to help you become a better you some of the things you facing will change instantly once you change. Does that make sense to somebody? Here's what I want you to remember about deliverance. I wrote these notes down because it resonates with somebody and I want you to take them with you. Deliverance takes a 40 year wilderness experience and turns it into a quick shuttle ride to your prophesied place. Remember, the Israelites, it took them 40 years when it was only an 11-day trip. So what God does is he uses this thing called deliverance and says, instead of it taking 40 years, it's just going to be a shuttle ride to the prophesied place. Deliverance takes your testimony from, 
I wish I had it. Two, it's finally mine. Somebody need to take that testimony. It, I, I, I don't wish I got it. It's already mine. Deliverance transports your prayers from God, I need you to do it to y'all, God done did it again. <laughs> Deliverance takes people's perception of you from it'll never happen to you to I always knew you were going to be successful. I hope you understand what I'm, you can't make that happen. You, you, you in and of yourself can't grow that business. You can't explode that ministry. You can't bless that. God has to get in it. And he only gets in it when you're moving his direction. Last but not least, deliverance is not just a one-time act of God, but it is a continual God process of bringing you into a better version of yourself so you can enjoy the fulfillment of his promise. I want you to bow your head, close your eyes, and I want you to think about the people, the places, the things that you know you, you've you've completed the cycles on so that you don't have to be a victim of it think about it but now I want you to think about the motion and the movement that is necessary for you to produce the discipline the direction and the deliverance for you to see the manifestation and the fulfillment of the promise of God. The Bible says God is not slack concerning his promise. His promises are yes and amen. Mama, father, son, daughter, hubby, wifey, young man, young woman. Yes, you went through it. Yes, they did it to you. But no, you don't have to live in that. You can choose to move in the direction of the things of God and live in the fulfillment of what God's got for you. I want everyone in this place with your head bowed, your eyes closed, I want you to repeat after me. Lord, today I receive discipline. I receive direction. I receive deliverance. And I ask for you to help me become the best version of myself so I can receive every promise that matches my next place. Lord, save me. Lord, deliver me. Lord, heal me. Lord, I need you to bless me indeed. Today, right now, in this moment, I receive it. I believe it. It is done. It is so. In Jesus' name, give God a shout of praise if you believe it and receive it.